was on the faculty at the University of Kentucky. In 1996, he joined our faculty here. We were able to pirate him away. And uh, after a little brief uh, uh, trip to Ohio State, he came back, and we're very happy that he did. He is currently the Associate Vice President for Translational Research, the Chief of Research of the Division of Gastroenterology, the <coughs> Director of the Clinical Trials Unit, the Associate Vice President for Health Affairs and Research. And his research interest, as many of us know, has to do a lot with nutrition and also alcoholic liver disease. And he has many grants um, in, uh, related to that. He's on numerous editorial bo boards, has been in an invited lectureship both nationally and internationally. And I would say, really, one of the things that impressed me most about looking at his CV, in spite of all these accomplishments, are the number of people that he has mentored. So he's really, truly been one of those persons who helps to train the future generation of physicians. Uh, he has numerous publications uh, to his credit, and I'm very happy that he will be speaking with us this morning about vitamin and mineral deficiencies in clinical medicine, diagnose that deficiency. Craig? Thanks, Barb. It's uh, always fun to give this talk. I try and do it about every four or five years because uh, uh, medical students and fellows aren't going to really see this anyplace else. And actually, a lot of these cases are on different boards that I've contributed to over the years. So uh, I have no disclosures related to this talk. Uh, this is where we're located and do our research. So our objectives in the next uh, 45 or 50 minutes are to um, be able to diagnose vitamin and mineral deficiencies and be able to uh, treat them. So minerals, uh, I think you all know iron deficiency uh, causes anemia. Magnesium can cause muscle cramps, heart arrhythmias. Calcium's involved in uh, uh, bone metabolism. Zinc is very interesting because it does a host of different things, ranging from skin lesions uh, to altered mental function. Uh, copper deficiency, we've actually learned a lot about recently. So we've known for a while that it causes anemia and neutropenia. And more recently, we've uh, found out that it causes a neuropathy. And then chromium deficiency causes glucose intolerance, and selenium can cause a, a myopathy. And with vitamins, you know, B12 and folate cause anemia. Vitamin A, depressed night vision. Uh, biotin is very interesting in the skin lesions and loss of hair color that you'll get. And thiamine deficiency can cause uh, neurologic problems. So how did I get interested in this and get involved in this? So as uh, Barb said, uh, I... Uh, was at the University of Minnesota for my fellowship and early faculty training. And uh, this is uh, me much younger in the 1970s. And I'd uh, gotten married, and my uh, wife's uh, father was a world famous uh, nutritional biochemist, and actually, so was her brother. So when we'd have uh, family meetings, why well, they'd talk about all these things, and I couldn't help but absorb a little bit of it. And at the same time, TPN was being developed. So we were able to keep people alive that you couldn't before by giving them infusions of glucose and amino acids and lipids. But there weren't any vitamins or minerals put in this originally. And so this is how we actually were able to uh, discover some of these things. And so this is what uh, Corvettes looked like in the 70s. They were still pretty good. So we move ahead 40 years. I, I look a lot older. The, the Corvettes actually are a little sharper, but uh, they were good back then. But we, we have fixed the uh, TPN issue. So why is this relevant at all? So we've moved to other nutritional problems in the United States. And I'll just give you some examples. So, when we talk about alcohol abuse, and I see patients in alcohol treatment programs, it's not that they're drinking three or four drinks a day. They're drinking 15 drinks a day. So this is over 2,000 calories 
uh, that are totally empty calories. There aren't any vitamins or minerals in beer. Uh, if you look at pop, which is even a much bigger problem in the United States, so I'm, I have clinic this afternoon, and I'll see people that are drinking 10 cans of pop a day, or 10 bottles of beer. So a bottle of Mountain Dew like this has 290 calories in it. So, you know, if you're drinking 10 of those, again, no vitamins and minerals. And the thing that really precipitated stuff was gastric bypass surgery, which is a malabsorption surgery. And so with the malabsorption, why the patients were not absorbing uh, minerals and vitamins. So we're going to go through some cases. I always like to start with this one. So it's a 56-year-old alcoholic male who was admitted to a VA hospital. He had abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. He had had a Bill Roth surgery for ulcer disease. And he got gotten to the point where he could only drink beer. He was happy with that. But then when he started throwing up the beer, why it was a problem. And so this is his endoscopic photograph. He has this pinpoint opening here. You can see how terrible endoscopy was in the 70s. And uh, so this should have been a big, wide open anastomosis here. And so he couldn't even get beer through now. And these are the classic skin lesions. So I, I usually throw a lot of skin stuff in for Jeff Callen, but he's not here. He's actually in the beach in Florida. We ran into one another in the airport yesterday. So Jeff can't uh, skew the results on this. So classic skin lesions around the eyes, nose, and mouth called acrodermatitis. And crusting lesions over the scrotum and buttocks. The last time I gave this, people said I grossed them out. So we uh, took out some vital areas here. So let's see next test that we uh, ordered here. So you have uh, 10 seconds, 12 seconds to get the right test here. And people are going in pretty good directions here. OK, so most people think it's zinc, which is the right answer. Niacin is actually a possibility. So niacin can give skin lesions too. But these are classic zinc deficiency skin lesions. So this patient had a serum zinc level of 10 micrograms per deciliter, normal 70 to 120. And just three days of oral zinc supplementation, even though this guy couldn't take anything by mouth, he was throwing up all the time, he absorbed enough oral zinc that these skin lesions went away. And uh, so zinc is a critical antioxidant. It plays a role in zinc metalloenzymes. It plays a structural role in these transcription factors called zinc finger proteins. And so the zinc is held in there by cysteine residues. And so what we know now is oxidative stress damages the cysteine, and the zinc floats out. So if you have oxidative stress, that can actually induce a zinc deficiency state, even if you're taking oral zinc in. And uh, then zinc also induces metallothionin, which is a metal binding protein it binds mainly zinc and copper. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, as its role in uh, treating Wilson's disease, for example. So you uh, give high amounts of zinc. That induces metallothionin and, and blocks copper absorption in the intestine. So zinc is really interesting because it can present in a host of different ways, the zinc deficiency. And I've showed you the skin lesions. We'll show you some more of those. In kids, it can uh, present as growth retardation. Uh, we've seen poor wound healing, impaired immune function. I'll show you some diarrhea cases. So, uh, and this is because these zinc finger proteins are so important in a whole host of metabolic processes. So um, the important concept here is that there are some patients, and a lot of these are people in the intensive care unit, who have much higher demands for zinc than the normal person. So you may think you're giving enough, but you're probably not. So these skin lesions are called acrodermatitis. 
And here's uh, one of our early patients that we described. Skin lesions around the nose and mouth, around the eyes a little bit. Uh, this patient had cancer with enterocutaneous fistulae. This is the first patient with Crohn's disease that was described. And again, uh, he had uh, multiple fistulae and classic lesions around the eyes, nose, and mouth. And again, over the uh, scrotum. And here's one of my uh, zinc deficient rats. So you can see again the classic crusting lesions around the eyes, nose, and over the paws here. So it's very similar from one species to another. Now, we mentioned poor wound healing. <clears throat> so again, back when I was at Minnesota, why uh, they had a, a patient that was at the university hospital, had uh, bad complications from surgery, multiple endocutaneous fistulae, and uh, these uh, fistulae just weren't healing. And so they shipped them over to the VA, and one of the residents in surgery that heard me talk about zinc said, you know, these crusting skin lesions over the ear might be zinc deficiency. And so here's a guy a week later with zinc supplementation. The fistulae have healed and his skin lesions have healed. Now, we mentioned diarrhea. And this is a patient that had C. diff. And I was actually scoping her to see if her C. diff was improving. And she had these terrible skin lesions around the buttocks here. And so uh, while she had an IV in, we just pulled off uh, some blood and ran it in my lab real quick. And her serum sink, again, was markedly reduced. And the amazing thing is these skin lesions, again, will, they look terrible, but they'll heal in two or three days. It's just amazing. I've had patients where I was going to come back and take pictures. I come back over the weekend, and everything's gone. And one of the things that zinc does is it disrupts barrier function. So if you have zinc deficiency, the tight junctions in the intestine are screwed up. You have increased gut permeability. And this is a study in Crohn's disease where you have diarrhea, where they gave zinc supplementation, and the gut permeability improved after eight weeks of zinc therapy. Now, this is a young girl uh, with zinc deficiency. So uh, she was, at the, again, at the University of Minnesota, had a, uh, uh, actually most of her bowel cut out because of uh, uh, congenital abnormalities. And so she was on TPN, and we were giving her the appropriate amount of zinc, or what we thought was the appropriate amount. And she developed these lesions around the mouth. So children develop just little kind of chelosis areas around the mouth but this terrible looking kind of like diaper rash over the buttocks. So different ages, you develop a different distribution. And here is her growth curve. So it's basically flat. We start her on hyperalimentation. Her growth takes off. But then her serum zinc goes down. She gets this rash here. And you can see her growth stops, even though we're giving her the same amount of amino acids, glucose, and everything. We start IV zinc, a much higher dose. Her growth takes off. Her zinc goes up, and her skin rash gets better. And so this is an example of where she had such anabolic demands for zinc that even though we were giving her theoretically the right amount, uh, she needed a lot more. So second case, a 56-year-old uh, alcoholic cirrhotic male uh, this guy was in every one of my studies. Uh, and uh, he had an auto accident at midnight, was driving his pickup truck. Uh, but uh, when they did a breathalyzer on him, uh, it was negative. And they did a blood alcohol. They, they couldn't believe it. And everything was negative, and so the police were concerned what was going on. So what tests didn't I do? So uh, 
everybody is doing this incorrectly. It's which test did I not do? <laughs> not is the so uh, everybody fails on this big leg. So the test that we didn't do was the selenium. So this patient has uh, problems with uh, night vision, as we'll show you. So has low vitamin A, low carrier protein for vitamin A, retinal binding protein, and low zinc. And the next test that we did then was a night vision test. So they can do this in ophthalmology. We actually had, I had a test, uh, one of these machines in my research lab, so we did it there. And this is, uh, you're looking into a little lamp and just bringing the light intensity down to the uh, level where you can barely see it. And so um, uh, this is light intensity here. And here's this patient. Uh, so and this is light intensity on log units. So this guy's terrible. Here's my night vision. So originally you're seeing with your cones, which you use for daylight vision, then you adapt your rods at about uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, and then it's kind of like going into a matinee movie theater. It takes a while for your eyes to adapt. So we gave this guy some vitamin A, got better. We gave him some zinc, and he even got better. But he still has this long lag time. So every time car headlights hit him, he won't be able to see for very well for you know five minutes afterwards. So this is why this guy drives erratically. So vitamin A is very important for vision, especially dark adaptation. It gives you dry eyes. It can give you some abnormal uh, skin findings. And it's involved in a bunch of uh, uh, critical signaling now, biochemical signaling. And this is vitamin A metabolism. So it's absorbed in the intestine bound to chylomicrons. It goes to the liver where it's stored as retinol or the alcohol form of vitamin A and EDO cells, and those are the things, uh, stellate cells that are important in liver fibrosis. And then it's released, bound to retinol binding protein, and goes to the eye for night vision. So this retinol binding protein is made in the liver, and so if you're sick, this is a visceral protein. If you have liver disease, if you're septic, this goes down. And so if you give too much vitamin A when this is low, why well, you can cause vitamin A toxicity. OK, so this is a fairly recent case, a 60-year-old uh, with uh, Bill Roth referred for myelodysplasia, uh, question of whether he needed a bone marrow transplant, uh, low absolute neutrophil count. Uh, he was anemic, transfusion dependent, and he also had some numbness in his legs. So what's the next test here? Yeah, people are hot on this. So we've seen several of these cases, and actually the hematology services have seen several, too, that we've talked about. So this is copper deficiency. And actually, in the workup of myelofibrosis now, the hematologists always get a serum copper and ceruloplasm level. And so you can see he's transfusion dependent, gets a transfusion, goes up for a while, then goes down, uh, neutrophil counts down, start intravenous copper, neutrophil count goes up, no more transfusions. So copper deficiency results in an anemia that's not responsive to iron therapy. So it's usually normocytic or mi microcytic. And, um, once in a while, you can get uh, hypopigmentation, immune dysfunction. And then recently, these neurologic deficits, especially peripheral neuropathy, have been described. And oral zinc induces this metallothionin, again, in the intestine. And so that's uh, why high zinc therapy can block copper absorption, which, again, is the rationale for giving zinc in Wilson's disease. In fact, that was the first orphan drug uh, ever made. So the next guy is a tennis partner of mine uh, with Crohn's disease. He's had eight surgeries, but he's in really good shape. Uh, he's a photographer for National Geographic. 
and he always beats me uh, in uh, tennis, which was a problem. But uh, fortunately, he was getting a little stiff. His uh, docs told him he had osteoarthritis, and uh, I may have a chance of beating him. Uh, I told him it didn't sound like osteoarthritis. So what test did I order? You guys are hot on this too. So uh, <clears throat> vitamin D would be a reasonable thing, but magnesium, if you have people with muscle cramps, uh, it's almost always, if it's not potassium, which everybody thinks about, then it's almost always magnesium. Uh, and if you look at our liver patients, our cirrhotics, this is, fatigue is the thing they complain about most. Number two is usually muscle cramps, which people don't think about. And we give uh, zinc and magnesium there. And um, the, um, so this guy was magnesium deficient, and magnesium, again, causes muscle cramps, weakness, and can play a role in certain cardiac arrhythmias. And so we gave this guy magnesium shots, which are actually very uncomfortable. Um, so... Why was I giving this guy magnesium shots instead of just oral magnesium? Does anybody know? So, so he had Crohn's disease with short bowel, so giving more oral magnesium is just going to give you more diarrhea. So that's a big thing that you need to watch for in Crohn's disease. And uh, we actually, I actually had some patients where they just came in for a weekly IV magnesium infusion. So... This is actually a very important case. So a 24-year-old girl, uh, BMI of 46, had a gastric bypass. So the critical thing here is she's had three admissions for nausea and vomiting over a short period of time after her bypass. So now three months, so this is not a long time post-bypass. She comes in with headache, slurred speech, diplopia, confusion, and coma. Which one? So her life literally depends on whether you guys are right. Okay, so pretty good. So it's IV thiamine. So um, we gave her, uh, I think, either 50 or 100 milligrams, I can't remember, of IV thiamine. And so you have to do that literally immediately. And 80% uh, of her symptoms were gone by one week. So this, again, we said gastric surgery has brought a lot of these things back to the forefront. And this is a good example. So this has this uh, name, APGARS, Acute Post-Gastric Reduction Surgery Neuropathy. And the critical thing with thiamine deficiency is it occurs quickly. And so the classic story is just a short time after they've had their surgery, uh, they'll come in. They always have recurrent nausea and vomiting. So the other thing you guys thought might be is B12. And B12 could be something. It can give you a neuropathy. And uh, usually you don't have this rapid progression to coma with B12, though. But the more important thing is you've got five years of B12 in your liver. So you've got short stores of thiamine. You've got five years stores of B12 in the liver. So the timing is the critical thing there. So Wernicke's encephalopathy, the classic triad again, is confusion, ataxia, and optimoplegia. And um, again, it's fine to go ahead and order the thiamine deficiency that's not going to come back right away. You need to give IV thiamine right away. So um, this is a girl that I took care of uh, in Lexington. Uh, so she's 34 years old, had Crohn's disease diagnosed for two years, but actually probably a lot longer than that. Uh, she pre presented with fatigue, shortness of breath, a lot of fatigue complaints. And her uh, private gastroenterologist said, I just can't deal with her anymore. And so she was on uh, zinc and 
a 5-ASA agent. And uh, so I got some blood work on her, and uh, she was anemic. And so these are the things that I thought about. Uh, she was actually macrocytic, and she was actually very uh, folate deficient. And so I was also getting a CT scan uh, just to assess uh, uh, the extent and severity of her disease. And the radiologist called me up. Uh, they fortunately get a little bit of the chest there and said, you know, she's got bilateral pulmonary emboli. She's got <laughs> nothing patent in her body. And so that's why she was so short of breath. And so the next laboratory test that we got, anybody know? So it was a homocysteine, which was very elevated. And so that plays a role in the hypercoagulable state that you see in uh, a lot of people with uh, um, B12 or folate deficiency. So another uh, patient, status post-bariatric surgery, rapid late weight loss, was started on TPN, developed glucose intolerance and peripheral neuropathy. And the mineral that's deficient there is chromium. And chromium, the other name for this is a glucose tolerance factor. So probably won't see a lot of these, although I think Shri maybe had a case. One of the endocrinologists did it at the VA in a uh, um, patient that had had gastric surgery. Um, and naturally, the VA wouldn't pay for the chromium uh, because it wasn't a medicine. But um, um, so once in a while, you see this. So with people that uh, have new onset of uh, glucose intolerance and neuropathy on top of it. Think about that. A 40-year-old with a short bowel syndrome uh, patient was on home TPN for five years and developed cardiomyopathy. Um, so we have a trace element that's deficient there. And the cardiologists are all shaking their head. They, they know what this is. So it's selenium deficiency. So selenium deficiency can cause a myopathy and a cardiomyopathy. And this was first described uh, in <coughs> China, in Keishan province. So the reason this would never happen, except for TPN or something like that in the United States, but does happen or did happen in China, is we don't eat what we grow. So our food shipped all over the country. And so there are areas of soil that are selenium rich, that are areas of soil that are selenium poor. That's even in the United States. But again, nobody in the United States eats what they grow. So that's why you don't see it here. But in Keishan province, which is very selenium poor in China, why the patients got it and their animals actually got it. Now, the other interesting thing about selenium is Selenium deficiency can cause a virulent Coxsackie virus to mutate and become virulent. And there's a woman, uh, Belinda Beck, at uh, North Carolina that she's made her whole career looking at uh, viruses that mutate uh, in a selenium deficient environment. But Coxsackie's the major one. Next patient, actually. Uh, helped make my early career. He was on multiple papers with multiple deficiencies. So 36-year-old uh, patient with Crohn's disease, had it for a long time, had uh, multiple surgeries, a colostomy, uh, he had short bowel syndrome, had fistulae, and was one of the uh, first people actually on home TPN. And uh, he knew more about home TPN than actually most of us did uh, taking care of him. And so his TPN included uh, a vitamin solution and a lipid solution, intralipid. And he had chronic urinary tract infections and was on intermittent therapy for this. And he developed a skin rash. Uh, we gave him a truckload of zinc because he originally had zinc deficiency. We reported that, but didn't fix him. We gave him more lipids, 
He originally had the fatty acid deficiency. That didn't fix it. Uh, he got depressed for good reason, had some uh, paresthesias, and uh, this is what he looked like. So uh, he lost his uh, hair and lost the color of his hair and had uh, these uh, skin lesions around his mouth and uh, this conjunctivitis. And uh, we were really at a loss to know what was going on. Uh, fortunately, he was a lot smarter than we were. So uh, a couple months later, he walks into my office, looks like this, and said, I figured out what was going on. And so um, in the vitamin solutions for home hyperalimentation, uh, they, um, for the chronic patients, why they have what this guy was deficient in. Um, but uh, there had been a shortage of that vitamin preparation, so they switched him over to another one without telling anybody. So this guy had biotin deficiency, which uh, presents exactly like we showed you. This guy was in JAMA. This is really the first good reported case in the United States. So he had conjunctivitis, this dermatitis, and um, again, he developed uh, lethargy and paresthesias. And so his problems were, and this is the reason why not many people get it, he had no intake. Your GI tract normally makes biotin, but he was on antibiotics for his urinary tract infection, so that suppressed it. And then he had all these losses with the fistula that he had. So this is a uh, recent case, and uh, what I'm seeing in clinic all the time. So 18-year-old white male, he was sent for increased liver enzymes. He's been overweight all of his life. Uh, he was drinking at least 12 Mountain Dews a day. Uh, he was trying to cut back. He actually <clears throat> came from a little town in Kentucky. A uh, surgeon there sends me all these cases of NASH. And, uh, but he was very worried about this guy because uh, uh, his uh, serum copper and ceruloplasm were low, and he was concerned that he might have Wilson's disease. <clears throat> and the guy came in, and uh, he said, my, my doc told me you're going to be pissed at me for uh, all these Mountain Dews that I'm drinking, so I've cut down from 12 to 4. And so he would literally line them up in the refrigerator at one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening, one before he went to bed. So he was literally addicted to him. So on physical exam, uh, really nothing going on. In his labs, he had mildly elevated ALT. Uh, everything else was normal. Uh, the workup panel, the Dr. Marsano panel that we get was, again, normal except his ceruloplasm and his copper were both modestly low. And so, what would be the right next test? So, actually, any one of them would be okay. I got a 24-hour urine copper because it's probably the easiest to get. So, if this guy has Wilson's disease, his urine copper is going to be very high. He actually had a low urine copper. And so that meant that his kidneys were trying to retain copper because he was actually copper deficient. So this is something that we're actually studying in the laboratory right now, is the interaction between a marginal copper diet, which the American diet is marginal in, and especially if you drink a lot of sugared pop. And uh, so if you have marginal copper and high fructose, there's an interaction there that leads to fatty liver. And so that's one unique phenotype of fatty liver. So here in our experimental animals, we have an adequate copper diet, marginal copper diet, uh, adequate copper with fructose. Still not seeing much, but the two together, you see these white dots here, the fat in the liver. And here it's the combination that causes the liver enzymes to go up. And interestingly, the iron goes up in the liver. So there's a metabolic interaction there. And so a lot of these kids 
have elevated ferritins, have elevated serum iron. So the other reason they get sent in to me is for hemochromatosis workup, when actually the only thing they have is POP toxicity. So the last case that I'm going to talk about uh, just happened a couple years ago. Uh, in fact, we just finished it up recently. So law firm contacted me. Um, well, they, they called me first, and I said, you know, what you're describing couldn't possibly happen. And I'm too busy to deal with this, but I'm going to give you the name of a good friend who's an expert in the area. So they called me back a year later, and they said, well, we're getting sued all over the place for this, and your good friend is uh, for the guys that are suing you, so we want your help. <laughs> so it's a class action lawsuit, and uh, also some individual cases. And these patients had peripheral neuropathy and neurologic complications. They had, uh, some of them had anemia, and they had high serum zinc and low serum copper. So who did the law firm represent? Which one of these companies that makes what? So yeah, so this was in the news. Um, it's in USA Today, um, a bunch of uh, uh, Ladies Home Journal and this kind of stuff. So widely uh, publicized. And it was uh, denture cream. And so zinc is the adhesive that was put in all dental paste. It, it's the thing that causes your teeth to stick in there in the denture cream. And uh, <clears throat> so they called me about this. And I said, there's no way that people can be absorbing enough zinc from denture cream uh, to uh, be blocking copper absorption. And, uh, and they told me how much was in there. I did the calculations. Well, it turns out that, uh, well, first, um, zinc is very effective at blocking copper absorption if you take enough. And there are 27 proteins that regulate influx of zinc in and out of tissues. They're called ZIPs and ZNTs. And uh, these can have polymorphisms and mess up zinc metabolism. And the metabolism of copper is also highly complex. Uh, I showed you a little bit of that earlier. Uh, so it's a complicated situation. So <clears throat> can these cases really be real? Well, it turns out that some of them were, that these guys were actually basically eating their denture cream. So they were taking in two, three, four tubes a week. And uh, so massive amounts. Um, and likely, a lot of these people had polymorphisms in these transporters. And so uh, this is an interesting thing, talking to the company. Um, so we could identify some of these polymorphisms. And so this could be the ultimate personalized medicine. So. Uh, you get gene profiling to see whether you can take denture cream or not. <laughs> Company didn't think this was a great idea. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can do uh, gene profiling and look at polymorphisms for breast cancer, but for denture cream, they didn't think that this would go over. So they said uh, they're going to get rid of the zinc, which they actually had a hard time doing, but have ultimately done. And they said the heck with personalized medicine. So in conclusion, nutrient deficiencies aren't actually infrequent. And especially in GI diseases, we see them uh, uh, fairly often. And so the important thing is you need an awareness uh, to recognize these and then treat them appropriately, especially things like thiamine deficiency, where things can be actually life-threatening. And if you don't treat them, the neurologic deficits don't get better. Actually, the same with copper deficiency. So let me stop and see if there are any questions. Thank you.
is going to give you a, a simple base of very unfixed. Right, right, right. Right, right. But to then think about that, you know, I'm sure you all do, is he's presented as master, you know, the barest idea in the possible medium. Yep. And who can't turn up the man's 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 and that, that's actually echoed around the country. So, as you know, obviously, for a workup of myelodysplasia now, all you guys do copper and ceruloplasm. But um, I know Emory actually has about 160 cases of this uh, copper deficiency uh, presenting either as anemia or the uh, neuropathy. Yeah, so everything's individualized. So some of where they are run by a thing called atomic absorption, why it's simple that every lab does that. Uh, so magnesium, iron, zinc, copper, uh, th those are easy. Uh, whether they tell you anything or not is kind of a different story sometimes. So um, my issue with serum zinc, it goes down with acute stress. So if I went to the ICU and I found somebody with a normal serum zinc level, they should not be in the ICU. None of my patients with alcoholic cirrhosis have a normal serum zinc level. And um, so um, the inflammation causes the zinc to go down. So, so there, if somebody's sick, we just give zinc. Uh, the copper levels are usually pretty helpful. Magnesium levels can actually be normal and still have low total body magnesium stores, so you can be tricked there. For the um, things like selenium and copper, those are sent out. They usually ultimately go to the Mayo Clinic to get run. Steve. Yeah, yeah. So obviously. Uh, and not just related to the Mountain Dew, but anybody with an apple is likely to have uh, insulin resistance. I mean, they go hand in hand. And the other thing that's important to us is diabetics have a much worse course of fatty liver disease. So they get fibrosis much more quickly and much more severely. So it's a big deal. So we're linked with the endocrinologist. We work with Shri a lot on fatty liver because uh, basically uh, when we're over there in clinic, uh, you guys are, and we're seeing the same patients, unfortunately, or fortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, TPN, developed cardiomyopathy, didn't respond to selenium. So, um, you know, it, it could be viral-induced, too. And um, so, like I say, a antioxidant-depleted environment can cause uh, some of these viruses to mutate. So that would be another possibility. Great. Thank you. Uh, I, I take a vitamin every day. Oh, yeah, yeah.